today we're going to begin going right through now and jumping right into Ezekiel chapter 40, if we'll join there. Having set the background, we hope, for the expectation that we should have before we get to the prophecy of Ezekiel of what the kingdom will be like, elements of it, and particularly this house of prayer, the center of worship, the center of government of the whole world during this millennial reign of Christ. And so hopefully we were able to draw upon passages that we're familiar with that can add those little pieces. And you'll remember that as we concluded our last section, we came up with a list of things to expect, a list of details, um, criteria that would have to be accommodated in this house of prayer for all nations. We saw this emphasis that it was going to be at Jerusalem. And almost every verse that we looked at, it was associated with a mountain, with a hill, an elevated place. And this seems synonymous with the term of a house, or a city, or a temple. In Zechariah, we talked about it being an elevated place, as we did in Psalm 48. We saw that it was going to be built by people out of the nations. The sons of strangers would come to build this place. And notable features of this building would be that it would have a holy place. It would have towers and bulwarks and walls and foundations and gates. It would be a place that would incorporate the revival or reinstitution of animal sacrifice. That there would be immortal priests and that there would be mortal priests of the house of Levi. But it wouldn't just be an unimpressive, uh, uninspiring place, but it would be huge in its extent. It would be something that would cause awe in the eyes of the people who will come out from year to year to worship. It would be adorned with trees and with rivers and with streams. And this would be the place from which the government and the religious instruction of the whole world would emanate from. And we ended off with that quote uh, from the psalmist that says, One thing have I desired, and that will I seek after, to dwell in the house of my God forever. And that will I seek and so that is the encouragement for us, brothers and sisters, as we go through. The reason for building this vision is to help us so that we can echo those words. That there is one thing that we desire and one thing that we seek after. Now, one of the purposes of the vision, we talked about generally what the purpose of a vision is uh, uh, that we're familiar with. Where there's no vision, the people perish. But there's a couple of points in Ezekiel which are quite encouraging. Uh, that lay down what the expectation is, what God's expectation of the effect of this prophecy is. Now we saw in chapter 40, briefly and at verse 4, that the injunction to Ezekiel was that he would behold with his eyes, hear with his ears, and set his heart upon everything that God would show him. So this was a full sensory experience that he was going to have. It wasn't just listening or having the vision placed in his mind. He was going to be in a situation in this vision where he would observe everything. He was going to hear things. He's going to smell things. He's going to record them in his heart and on paper. And this is the purpose. It says, once you've heard this, you're going to go and show it to the house of Israel. This is the intent that I brought you here. And so as we looked at the, the, the overall theme of tell it to the generation following, even Ezekiel was given this injunction. You're going to learn this and you're going to take it back. Let's just go to chapter 43 just for a moment, because chapter 43 gives us uh, another interesting uh, exhortation. So by the time we get to chapter 43, we finish the bulk of the measures and the dimensions of this house of prayer for all nations. We're going to go forward, we'll look at a, an overview in a second. But now having given them all the hard stuff, if you want, the stuff that maybe we find difficult to visualize, he sees the glory re-enter the house, the glory that had left at the beginning of his prophecy. And then this injunction is given to the people. God declares, this is, in verse 7, the place of my throne, the place of the soles of my feet, where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. This is answering those passages like Deuteronomy chapter 12. And then he condemns Israel for their, their wickedness in the past, the reason they've gone into captivity. But look what he says in verse 10 now. And think about what, think about the first three chapters that we haven't looked at, but we're going to look at. He says, now thou son of man, Show the house, this house, to the house of Israel. Well, we understand that's what he's going to do. But for what purpose? That they may be ashamed of what they have done. And then let them measure the pattern. I don't know about you, brothers and sisters, but when I would read through chapter 40 to 49, the last reaction 
that ever came into my mind was shame, except maybe shame for not being able to understand any of it. But the purpose of an understanding of this, God says, is I need Israel to be ashamed. They've gone into captivity because of their wickedness. They haven't repented. What I need is for them to be ashamed of their iniquity. And if they're ashamed, if this vision has the effect in their heart of turning their hearts to God, well, then we'll show them the rest. We'll show them the good parts. And that's what he goes on to say. He says, if they're ashamed, then... Show them the form and the fashion, the goings out, the comings in, the ordinances, the forms, the laws, and let them write it in, and write it in their sight that they may keep the whole form thereof. Now, brothers and sisters, we need to get to that point. With Ezekiel, yes, but with the whole vision of God, that when we see what God has in store, it's a power to change. It helps us to be ashamed of the things we may be doing or the things we may be thinking, and it's a power to change. And God tells us that if we will do that, then he will open our eyes to behold the wondrous things that are revealed in his word. And another point, brothers and sisters, in verse 10, you notice that when it says Ezekiel was to show this house to the house of Israel, it wasn't just for him to understand. Because he says, if they're ashamed, then let them measure the pattern. And so here's what he says, brothers and sisters. He's gone through and he's measured this whole thing. And Ezekiel says, I've got it. And he takes it to them and tells them the message. He says, you got it? Now here's a ruler. You go measure it yourself. Because they have to make it their own. They have to be involved. They have to walk through this vision that Ezekiel is going to now. He's going to tell them what the angel told him. And in their mind, they're going to walk through this vision together. And so, brothers and sisters, we can do the same. And that's what we're going to try and do as we go forward now. Now let's just put a bit of context to Ezekiel chapter uh, 40 to 48. We'll probably... Very familiar, even if we're not familiar with this section from 40 to 48, we're familiar with its context. This is a general picture of what we understand and uh, uh, of what's going to happen when Christ returns. Christ returns and the saints are gathered together, the dead are raised, and there is this period of judgment. And while that's happening, and Christ and the saints likely at Sinai for the judgment process, the world is in this time of trouble such as never was that Daniel chapter 12 talks about. Then we have the Battle of Armageddon when Russia from Ezekiel 38 is coming down to take Israel. And Christ and the saints, as Zechariah chapter 14 tells us, they come at this point saving Israel from the northern oppressor. And Christ's throne now begins to be established in Jerusalem. And over the next 40 years, we find that as Revelation 12, 14 tells us, that the saints are going to be involved in taking this gospel to the nations, the millennial gospel, in preparation for God's demand that the world come in submission to him. And there's the mercy of God, brothers and sisters, that even at that point, he still sends out the word first, this millennial gospel, calling nations to submit, because he's going to use the same basis of judging the nations in this period of judgment over the next 30 years as he does for us today. We're judged based on the word of God, aren't we? John chapter 12 tells us that. He uses the same principle as he judges nations and calls people to submit. And we know that many nations and many kings, as we saw yesterday, will submit, but many, of course, won't. And so there will be this judgment upon the nations, particularly those Catholic nations which are in opposition to Christ being in Jerusalem. And then we find that once that's all accomplished and the world is cleaned up and people are prepared and the Jews are all back in the land, now this millennial reign of Christ and the saints can begin officially with this temple. So when we look at Ezekiel chapter 36 to, to, to 40, we have that section that talks about the restoration of Israel. So while all this is happening, we have Ezekiel 36 to 37, Valley of Dry Bones, Israel coming back out of dispersion, the whole house of Israel being restored in the land and God's spirit poured upon them. In other words, their conversion. And that's happening all through this time period. So that by the time the temple opens, we have the nation of Israel who is now offering an offering in righteousness. The tribe of Levi has been purified and prepared and trained for service in the temple. Chapter 38, our Armageddon chapter with Gog and Magog and, and all that. Well, that comes in really at this time period here. He goes back and he says to us, well, how is God going to make this change in Israel? Well, primarily through the battle of Armageddon and then this time in the wilderness of the people over the next 40 years. And then chapter 49, 39 of Ezekiel really deals with that next section. So he takes us from the events of Armageddon through the next 40 years of judgment on the nations and preparation of Israel so that by the time we get to chapter 40, 
Ezekiel's next vision carries on logically from where, where this timeline is. So hopefully that is helpful to kind of put things in perspective. So during that time, of course, then the temple itself is being built because it has to be ready on opening day on, in Ezekiel chapter 40. So just a quick overview before we get too far in of what, how the structure of Ezekiel uh, chapter 40 to 48 is. You might break it down a little bit differently, but generally speaking, chapter 40 to 42 gives us the setting uh, of the chapter. It gives us the rule for measure, like right at the very beginning. It says you're going to measure something. I want you to understand the measurement, the rule of measure as we go through. He's going to describe gates, outer courts, inner courts, inner gates, outer gates, inner temple, the altar. He's going to describe sacrifice, the mountain, the towers, the kitchens, and so on. All these elements of which our minds are already thinking, well, we looked at verses yesterday that include those. Chapter 43, we have the glory entering the temple, signifying God's willingness to come and dwell with the people after they've been purified. And then there's an appeal to the nations, uh, nation of Israel, to be moved by the vision as we just looked at. And then he describes, as we continue to go forward, the two orders of priests who are going to be involved in this temple. Chapter 40 and 45, we switch gears, and we look at a singular individual who is the most prominent in this section, and that's the one called the prince. And we're going to talk about his inheritance and, and the holy oblation, the portion set aside for the prince and for this, this holy space in the land of Israel. Chapter 46, we continue looking at the prince and the offerings that he's going to make and the corner towers of this great structure. And then chapter 47 to 48, we, as it were, zoom out from this temple structure. And we're going to look at things that relate to the land itself and the inheritance that was promised to Abraham. And then this very practical little addition at the end of this chapter, uh, uh, chapter 48, which describes how the mortal people are going to come and where they're going to stay as they come in their pilgrimage in preparation for going up to the temple. So that's just a little, a little overview of where we're going. So let's have a look at chapter 40 and verses 1 to 5. We're just going to briefly take an introduction. As I'm sure we can appreciate, there is much that could be considered in, in the introductory scene here, and we're just going to try and get the overview. <clears throat> Ezekiel chapter 40 and verse 1, in the five and twentieth year of our captivity, in the beginning of the year, in the tenth day of the month, in the fourteenth year after the, the, the city was smitten, in the selfsame day the hand of Yahweh was upon me, and he brought me thither. And the visions of God brought me into the land of Israel and set me upon a very high mountain by which or upon which was the frame of a city on the south. And he brought me there and behold, there was a man whose appearance was like the appearance of brass with a line of flax in his hand and a measuring reed. And he stood in the gate. So the picture we have here is Ezekiel in captivity in Babylon and he is taken in spirit and he's brought to the land of Israel. Now you think that Ezekiel has been in the land for some 14 or 15 or 20 years or somewhere in that range, depending on when he initially went into captivity. The Jerusalem that he now sees is entirely different than the Jerusalem when he left. He left Jerusalem as a city overrun by the Babylonians. And then while he is in captivity, very recent to this, uh, very current to this prophecy itself, he gets word that the temple has been destroyed. It's been raised to the ground by the Babylonians. And so he is no doubt in distress at this news. And then he is taken in vision. And he sees a place which is vaguely recognizable. The topography is all different. And yet the general landmarks are similar. And he is going to be overwhelmed by what he sees, the change that he sees. And so he comes to Jerusalem from the north. And he sat down. And as the text says, it says he brought him to the land of Israel and set me upon, or some translation suggests nearby, a very high mountain. So he comes and he's looking at this high mountain and there's some notable features that stand out to him. That on this mountain, he sees as it were, the frame of a city. He doesn't say he sees a city. He doesn't say he sees a frame, but he sees this thing that looks like the frame of a city, the framework of a city. And he's impressed by this. And while he's staring at that, he is now brought forward to a gate, most likely the north gate at this point. And he sees someone standing in a gate of this building. And he's observing. He tells us specific details. That there is this man standing. And he had the appearance 
of brass. Now, when we go through Scripture, brothers and sisters, we find a number of individuals who are associated with this appearance of brass. In Daniel chapter 10, we find that man who has the feet of brass. In the Apocalypse, that man of the one, in chapter 1, he has these feet of brass. He has this image, this, this idea of flesh that has been purified, the flesh that has been refined. And so we believe it speaks in type of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so this angel stands there as a witness of someone who is going to be there with him in that final day. And we find that if we were to move over into the same chapter and just a quick, quick look in verse 14, we find that he is actually a builder of this house. That this man is the one who builds the posts. He builds the towers. And as we see that these posts later are going to represent the saints themselves, we see this is the man who has built the saints. Who has built and prepared those who are going to be pillars in his house. And he holds two things in his hand. He holds this measuring line, this line of flax in his hand, and a measuring reed. We won't take the time to look too far into this line of flax, but... You would think, I would think, that if you have two different things, they seem like measuring devices. A line of flax. So if I had a long distance to run, I'd, I'd hold one end, and I know that my, my string is 500 feet long, and you run to the end, and we'll sort of, we'd measure it. A long distance measure. But do you know throughout the book, he never uses that for measuring at all. And yet, when we look at the symbology of what might be incorporated in this idea of, of flax, this linen, this refined, this carded linen is what the word indicates, Flax, it isn't just the raw stuff that's been pulled up and put on the housetop like Rahab did, but linen that has now been taken and refined. This is the fine linen which represents the righteousness of the saints that we read of in Revelation 19 and other places. And so what we have is this picture of Christ, this man of brass who has been refined and perfected, and he holds in his hand this line of flax, the saints, which elsewhere in Scripture we read that he holds them in his hand, and they are there as the builder of this glorious place. But he also has in his hand this other element. He has this reed, which we're going to look at in a moment. We read then, he says, <clears throat> And the, he said unto him, Son of man, declare what you have seen to the house of Israel. And then in verse 5, we'll just jump down. And behold, a wall around the house, around about, and, then, and in the man's hand, a measuring reed of six cubits long by the cubit and a handbreadth. So it measures the breadth of the building, one reed, and the height, one reed. So we're going to get to this in just a second. But what he's going to do now, and we just want to take a, a, a quick overview of, um, of what he's going to see. Whoops, I've got these out of order, sorry. And what he's going to do is he's going to take him, he's going to introduce him to this measuring reed, and then he's going to take him on a tour and measure all the gates in this building, in this outer building. Now, Brother Sully, when he put uh, a lot of work, obviously, into this topic, he made that notable conclusion that in the first chapter, in fact, in the three chapters that speak particularly about the structure, the majority, uh, like a, a, the largest proportion, is given to the gates themselves. And so he, he wrote this, uh, he said, the study has convinced the present writer and may convince the reader that the understanding of the construction of the gates is of supreme importance to the understanding of the whole structure. This may be gathered from the fact that the bulk of the 40th chapter is occupied in their descriptions. They are indeed the key of the specifications. Entering the building with this key and carefully remembering the injunction of Ezekiel's guide, we may unlock the mystery of the vision. The gates partake more of the character of gate buildings than the structural entrances we, which we conventionally understand by gates, such as a gate entering into a garden and so on. And we're going to go through as we walk, and we're going to hear a lot of pieces mentioned about these gates. As he goes now, and he's going to measure each piece, he's going to, talk, he's going to see stairs. He's going to see these gate buildings. He's going to see thresholds, which we would typically associate with doorways. He's going to see little chambers as you walk through these gate buildings. He's going to see porches. He's going to see posts that govern these porches. He's going to see entry gates and exit gates. He's going to see spaces. He's going to see narrow and closed rooms. He's going to see windows. He's going to see an outward court, and he's going to see this thing called a pavement. And he's going to see now a gate leading out of the pavement. So all these different things, and it's helpful as uh, we go through. Some might find it helpful to, to, to mark a number of features in this chapter. One would be to the, the directions, the northeast and the south, and to, so you can keep track of 
where exactly we're walking through this vision. Another is to maybe highlight the elements. What are the different parts and pieces that can help us to, to sort of put this together as we go? And so what he's going to do, and we're just going to just do, in two minutes we're going to cover the, the whole 40th chapter as far as an overview of where he's going to go so we can find ourselves. He's going to start off, as we just read, probably north of the city near the north gate, and he looks to the south and he sees this great mountain with the frame of the city on it. And then he's going to be taken, once he's met the man of brass with the measuring reed, in the north, he's going to be taken to the east gate, and he's going to start going through now and observing what he sees. And he's going to start by measuring this wall that we just read about, the base or the foundation. And then he's going to go, having gone through this outer wall and this outer gate, measuring all of its, of its particulars, he's going to notice that there is this, this pavement that runs about the three sides that he's going to specify. And then he's going to move up to the north gate, and he's going to measure the north gate. And he's going to say, wow, this is just like the east gate. And then he's going to travel around, and he's going to come down to the south gate on the outside. And he says, I measured the south gate on the outside, and oh, it's the same as the south gate, or sorry, same as the outer gate on the east. And he's going to travel inward, and he's going to say, well, I, I noticed that as I look across this pavement, there is another gate. And then he's going to go to the east, and he's going to go in, and he's going to say, oh, we've got another gate that leads in. And then he's going to travel up to the north on the inner gate. And so he's going to measure three sides. We can talk later, perhaps, about why he never mentions the west gate, or the west side. But he's going to go through this process, and maybe you notice as we go through that, there's, there's something particular about the way he goes through. Perhaps if you or I were to go through, we would not waste so many miles in our travels. I, if I was coming, I'd probably start on the east gate, and I'd notice, oh, there's a gate opposite me. So I'd do that one next. And then if I did go to the north, I'd probably do all the measurements up in the north area just to conserve time. And then I'd maybe go to the south and do all the stuff there. But what we find throughout this whole chapter, in the next two or three chapters, Ezekiel is going to go round and round and round and round and gradually work his way into the very center. He's going to waste a lot of steps from a human perspective. But God is going to draw him from the outside, from the profane, to the common, as it were, and he's going to bring him in to the most holy. But each time he circles this place, he's going to see more and more details which gives us the impression that he is so awed by everything he sees that he even forgets to look up and notice that there's multiple stories. Or even forgets to look over here and notice something. And he's going to get distracted by something he hears and smells and he's going to look behind him and, and add another feature totally out of context, it would seem. But that is a feature as we go through here. So let's join Ezekiel now on the east gate. Now, as he sees this man. So if you just, just catch verse... Um, verse 5 there and it says and behold there was a wall on the outside of the house round about he's referring to a foundation wall and he noticed that in this man's hand was a measuring reed of six cubits long by the cubit and a handbreadth so then he uses this to measure so right at the beginning he establishes the base of measurement so he says he's got this reed he tells us that the reed is made up of six cubits but that's not good enough he tells us that this cubit what we might refer to as a temple cubit, is different than most cubits. Most cubits we might think of as, as you know, the, the elbow to the fingertips, 18 inches-ish or so. But we find that this cubit is different. It's the cubit and a handbreadth. He says this cubit is a bit bigger than standard. And so when we look at what that measurement might be in American terms, it's about 22 to 24 inches, or two feet. And so we have this very large measure, this reed that he's going to measure with. Now, I thought we'd bring a big piece of wood that was 12 feet, but then someone else gave us the idea that we could, as an object lesson, take a good old tent pole in sections, and coincidentally, it just happens to be about one reed for each section of this tent post. But it gives you an idea of what this measuring reed was that he saw. So as he looks, does Ezekiel at this man, He's got this measuring reed of six cubits, or 12 feet. So we'll warn you as we go through and talk about measurements. In my mind, I think of six cubits, one reed, and then I always convert to feet because I can relate. But then sometimes I use the 12 feet, and I might say 12 cubits. So you're going to have to pay close attention, make sure I don't mix up. But he's going to go around, and he's going to use this device 
to measure anything that's more than six cubits, roughly. Uh, and he's going to measure it whether he's going to go around a city, and he's going to have to measure 500 of these as he goes around the outside. He's going to measure height with a reed like this. Now, how is someone going to go around a building and measure with one of these? It's not something you can stand in the corner and look. You can't do it without walking. And so I visualize as he goes through as the angel, as we go through, the angel lies us down on the ground and he says, all right, Ezekiel, can you just put your finger right there and keep track? Because Ezekiel's got to count. And the angel moves it to the next trip. Imagine how long that's going to take to travel around the outside of this building, which is 500 reeds or a mile square or so. And yet it gives us the picture of involvement. God is calling upon him to be involved in every step of this way as he goes through. Sometimes we're going to find that he measures things in just the cubit. And so we have to keep our minds as we go through. Now, one of the things, put this away before we hit something. One of the things that we will find as we go through the measurements, that there are cubits, there are reeds, there's half a cubit, there's a span, and there's a hand breadth throughout this prophecy as we go through. So there's different measures that are used. Now, in the, in the original text, sometimes we come across elements which don't have a unit. Sometimes it will say, you know, two cubits by three cubits. Other times it just says he measured it and it was 500 by 500. Or it was 12 by 12. And so the rule that is established in the beginning, which seems like a very reasonable rule to use, that anywhere we go in this prophecy where the units are not specified in the text, which usually shows up in italics in the King James anyway, then the rule is to use the reed. The, what he introduced to us in the beginning was use the reed if I don't tell you otherwise, as it were. And by doing that, we can get a consistent picture in which all the various elements and measurements will fit together in perfect harmony. So hopefully that will help as we go through with the measure. So now what Ezekiel is going to do, as we said, he's going to go with this man. He's going to start on the east, and he's going to work his way through this building, this immense gate structure that takes him from the outside, the profane, the common area, into what is described as the outer court. And we can associate that, in principle at least, as in the, the holy place uh, of the tabernacle. So, here is a picture, an artist, I don't know how well that shows up there, an artist's rendition, um, an art, a 3D rendition of what this temple would be like uh, based on the measurements that we have here. And you may have seen similar uh, images in Brother Sully's work or in drawings that are based on that. So, here is our priest, the man with the measuring reed in his hand. And he is going to stand up on that threshold, this area here, and Ezekiel is going to watch him as he measures the foundation of this, and then he's invited to join him as he goes through. So just to put that in perspective, there is this one reed high foundation wall that we read about. So 12 feet tall up to here. And there's our priest, assuming he just happens to be like Uncle Jay, six feet tall. or So there he is standing there to give perspective. And as he's invited to come up, oops, oops, he measures the threshold. He walks across this threshold area here, and he measures that this is one read also. And then what he's going to do over the next 16 verses is he's going to, this is for Uncle James, um, he's going to walk through, and he's going to come out. He's going to go all the way through and take measurements uh, along this side of the building, this gate building, and he's going to come around, and he's going to walk back out on the other side of this gate building. It's this, this immense structure, and he's going to notice things as he goes through, and then as he comes back, he's going to look across, and oh, I forgot to mention that. So what we want to do is we're going to walk through, uh, read through chapter 40, beginning at verse, um, beginning at verse 7, and we're going to have a, a top-down view of this temple building. So if this is the gate building right here, you can see we just looked at entering through. This is a top-down floor plan, if you like, based on the measurements here. And we're going to read through it, and as we see all these specific details, we'll try and highlight it on the screen. So reading then from uh, verse 6. And then he came unto the gate, which looks toward the east, and went up by the stairs thereof. And later on we find out that there are actually seven steps that lead up into the entrance of this temple. There are seven stairs, and he leads them up to the threshold of the gate, and he measures the threshold of the gate, and it's one reed across. So he measured it, he walks over, one reed broad. And the other threshold of the gate, which was run reed broad. So there are two thresholds as he enters in, and we'll see the significance of that 
a little bit later when we see the flow of people as they come in. And so he measures also the porch of the gate within one reed. So he enters through and he's one, one reed broad. And he's going to walk through now. And as he goes through in verse 10, it says, And there were little chambers of the gate on the eastward, and there were three on this side and three on that side, and they were all three of one measure. And he measured the breadth of the entry of the gate, ten cubits. Oh, sorry, I missed a piece there. Five cubits. Oh, I missed verse 7, sorry. So every little chamber was one reed long, and one read broad. So 12 foot square, as you look sort of as you wash through, there's 12 foot square buildings, each one of them. And between the little chambers were, were five cubit pillars. So there was five cubits between each. And as he goes through, he says, oh, we've got another threshold of the gate by a porch of the gate within. So he's moving forward and he says, there's this other porchway that he has to walk through. And he measured the porch of the gate within, and it is also one read. And then he measured he the porch of the gate eight cubits, and the posts thereof two cubits. So he's taking very careful attention as he walks through, and he's taking a measurement. He's laying this reed down or the cubit down, and he's following it all the way through as he walks through towards this inward area. And then he turns around and he comes back and he says, And the little chambers of the gate eastward were three on this side that he's just seen, and three on that side. And then there were posts, and the posts all had one measure on this side and one measure on that side. And he measured the breadth of the entry of the gate, 10 cubits, and the length of the gate, 13 cubits. And the space also before the little chambers was one cubit on this side, and the space was one cubit on that side. And the little chambers were six cubits on this side and six cubits on that side. So he's, he's kind of gone through, he's taken careful measurements of all the pieces, he's come back down this way, and he's measured uh, the area as he goes through. And he measures in verse 3, and he says, he measures then the gate from the roof of one little chamber to the roof of another. The breadth was five and twenty cubits door against door. So he's, he's somehow gone up here and he's measured across the top from one side of this gate building to the other, and he measures it, and it's twenty-five cubits. And then in verse 14 it says, he measured also the posts, three score cubits, even unto the posts of the court round about the gate. So around this gate, as he walks through, he sees that there are posts, and these posts are of an immense scale, which we'll see in just a moment. And it says in verse 14, he made the posts. And then in verse 15, it says, and from the face of the gate of the entrance unto the face of the porch of the inner gate were 50 cubits. So now he goes back through. We've seen he saw it was 25 cubits broad, and then he measures it all the way through, and it's 50 cubits long as he goes through from the outer edge to the outside of this porch area. So that's just numbers and details, isn't it? But he's trying to show us the immensity, and we start asking questions about why does it need to be so big? Is it just to make it more glorious than anything man has ever built, or is there a purpose? What is the purpose of these rooms that we see as he goes through? You saw those pillars, if you remember, up here we've shown it, that the pillars were 60 cubits, that's 120 feet as he looks up. And they look like palm trees, which we'll look at shortly. So he's walked through this immense building, and he's tried to convey to us in numbers and measures and rules and features what it might look like. So let's uh, put this in perspective here. Who recognizes this? It's here. If you stood here, you'd see it. So, Brother Robbie and I took some reed measurements. I asked for the man of brass to come and help me. And so we came and we measured. We thought, well, how can we put this building in perspective? And so we took our little reed. We started this wall and we went straight to the back wall. We measured it this way. And you know what is kind of neat? We measured that it was 23 cubits from wall to wall. That's only two cubits narrower than this gate building that Ezekiel sees. So he's two cubits short. So we, we're pretty close to get a visual. And then we measured front to back 38 cubits. And if we were to measure the building, remember he said it was 50 cubits from one end to the other as he walked through. That was from when he entered it to when he got out the gate at the back and then out to the porch because there was an overhang of a porch. Well, from there to there is 38 cubits from the back door. So we're only two cubits short. And then it was 10 cubits from the outside of the door 
to the edge of the porch post. And if you go down the ramp that's just outside the door, that takes you to the full 50 cubits or 100 feet. So it gives us an idea, brothers and sisters, of how big this is. As you entered into this place and you were just looking, you're going to walk through these immense gateways and you're going to enter in. And then we measured the height out of curiosity. And it happens to be 13 cubits, which just happens to be the height that he measures from this area here to the bottom. So this building, as you walk in here, brothers and sisters, particularly as you come in next time you come in through those doors, think to yourself, wow, that these walls would be straight up. This is the kind of a magnitude of just one of the many gates in this building. And he's going to call them to come in. And so when people marvel in those passages we looked at about the gates of God, the walls, the bulwarks, the towers, were set up in this very first little piece to get a sense of the magnitude of this place. Now Ezekiel is going to go through and he's going to walk and he's going to come back a bit later in the vision and look at them from the outside and go, wow, there's galleries, there's, there's different stories, there's three levels to this place and there's arches everywhere, arch upon arch upon arch as he goes through and describes it. In verse 16, and there were narrow windows to the little chambers and to the posts within the gates round about and likewise to the arches, the windows were round about inward and on each post were palm trees. Now what do palm trees represent, brothers and sisters, in Scripture? We could look in the Psalm, in Psalm 96, and it says that the righteous shall flourish like the palm. And they'll grow like the cedars. But then it also says that they shall be planted in the house of my God. And so as someone would walk up to this building, and they would see this great post which is ordained like a palm tree, they would be able to be instructed that this is a picture of the saints. The saints from the previous age, our age that we're living in, who have tried to understand and to reflect the righteousness of God and certainly to declare it in our lives. He says, this is your hope. You get to be a pillar in the house of God. And that's how the apocalypse says it. To him that overcomes will I give to be a pillar in the house of my God. And so, brothers and sisters, when we walk up there for the first time and we look at this and we see those pillars, we can say, yep. That was us. God worked in our lives to develop his righteousness. And he told us that if, the right, if we would try for that righteousness, God's righteousness, then we'd be like a palm tree. And we'll see that palm tree on that post. And whatever gate we go into, oh, we're going to say, yep, that's just what God says. And that's this, this example for the next thousand years for all the mortals that come in to say, that's what you can be. Because there's still an invitation for them to become these palm trees. So, sometimes they might look at that and say, really? Will people actually build that? Well, apart from the fact that we're going to have a divine architect with every mathematical, structural calculation that architects need, this will be the most perfect design, so we wouldn't doubt what our God can do. But I thought this was interesting just to put in perspective something. So this is, um, this is the Pont du Gard aqueduct in Nîmes, France. So this is something that was built by the Romans way back when the Romans were building aqueducts to take water from one place to another. But I thought it was interesting to kind of see that out of stone, just with Romans building it, they could build this aqueduct which runs for many miles. So this section that you see here is about 900 feet long. So 900 feet long on one wall of this temple building that we read about as being 500 reeds or a mile square you could fit seven of these. This section that you see, seven of those 900 feet long sections would be as long as the out, outer wall of this temple. So when we look at this, this was, when this was built, from one side to the other, the width wise of this is um, 30 feet wide or 15 cubits. So it's, what do we decide? It's about half the width of this building, just to give it in perspective. It's 160 feet high or 80 cubits or, six, or 13 reeds tall. So just to put that in perspective of this building, loosely to scale, if this is the building that Ezekiel sees with those measurements that we very briefly looked at, this is what this aqueduct is like. That's the same height, roughly. So really, we shouldn't be surprised that God's construction could be so grand when man has made, rather unimpressively, of course, um, these, these fairly magnificent structures as we look around the world today. And we, we could look at many different things that, that man has built in its grandeur and its size, and it kind of helps us to maybe take away the wonder of, could you really make it that big? So let's take a cross view now of what Ezekiel has seen, because when he comes through, 
And as we said, remember, he started off on the outside, and he went to the outside here. And when he got up to here and he looked at the outer gate building, and he looked across this pavement area, and he said, oh, there's another gate, but I'll get to that later. He came around to the outside here, and he measured the outer gate, said, oh, it's the same as the east gate. And he looked across this pavement, and he goes, oh, there's another gate. Well, let's measure that while we're here. And he measured this. And he saw that it was a mirror image. And so just those, can everybody see that on this side of the room? So he measures it, and he sees there's these seven steps that go up. And then he measured the, the, the wall that was one reed by one reed. That was the basic measurement, the foundation measurement that he's going to use as he goes through. Then he measures the threshold that was a reed. And as he goes through, he noticed that there's these three chambers, each one six cubits by six cubits, or one reed by one reed, in between which there were these posts of five cubits. And then he noticed that there was another threshold as he's about to leave the main building portion. And he walks out under this porch, which is eight cubits, or 16 feet. When he walks under that covered porch, he notices he measures these posts at the ends. They're quite impressive to him. They're two cubits, or four feet square, as he looks at these posts. And then he walks across this pavement. And he's amazed. And he says, this is pavement. He looks north. And he looks south. And he says, there's this pavement that runs around all the three sides, at least, that he has caused to measure. And he looks up, and he sees chambers. And he says, behold, chambers everywhere. And he counts 30 chambers as he goes around these three sides. So presumably 10 chambers on each side, each divided by a gate to make that distinction between these chamber buildings. And each of these chamber buildings seems by the, if we look at the, the Hebrew words, indicates a room with many rooms and, and, and pillars and so on. And so great vast amounts of areas within these buildings for some purpose that uh, we get a hint of later as we go through. And so he sees this pavement. And this pavement we're going to see is, uh, sorry, and then we have the inner court gate that he's measured as we move in towards the center of the building, which has basically the same measurements but in reverse, as we're told. Now each of these outer wall buildings is 50 cubits wide, or 100 feet each, including the porch. When he's finished doing all this, he says, well, how far is it between these two buildings? And he measures it 100 cubits from the face of the building to the face of the building, not including the porch. So we've got a space which is 180 cubits across, or 30 reeds, just to give that in perspective. This is the magnitude. So 200 feet is two of these buildings way out into the other side of the parking lot of this grand open area that's 200 feet wide and is going to run nearly a mile long in, every, in, in, in each side. As people come in to worship, brothers and sisters, Maybe when we read verses that talk about being impressed with the courts of the house of Yahweh, maybe we get a sense of why someone would be impressed. I mean, just to walk through this gate building would be impressive. If anybody's done any traveling, particularly in Europe, and you've seen the amazing stone buildings that they, they have made, uh, the different cathedrals and so on, and you wonder, like, how did these ever get built? And granted, some of them took over 100 years to get these buildings built, but the great stones and the high arches, 100 and some odd feet high, spanning great distances, it's amazing to think that that could be done. Well, this is going to cause even people who have gone on tours to Europe to be amazed at this structure. So these are the porches. So brothers and sisters, this is perhaps something like what Ezekiel would have seen as he walked through and as he turned and he looks up this pavement and he says, behold, chambers and pavements and porches, as though he's overwhelmed by the quantity and the number. And as we said, as he looks uh, from here and he looks north and he looks south he sees all these chambers and he, and he goes up on all sides he says there's chambers everywhere there's these t chamber buildings 10 on each side a total of 30 and this here is 100 cubits from face to face so 200 feet approximately so brothers and sisters if we were to try and put that in perspective I should have put our little uh, uh, picture of the priest here he'd be like barely coming up a quarter of the way up these posts that's the magnitude of this and you can imagine how many hundreds of thousands, perhaps, of people could fit into an area that big. As people are coming up year by year, week by week, month by month to worship. And coming into the courts. And learning and hearing from the Levites and the priests. And you and I, brothers and sisters, as they come up for various purposes. And all these people are going to be coming up. And you know, I don't know, I'm sure that most parents have talked about the kingdom with their children in this way. And you know, when your children say, what's it going to be like? And you say, well... You come up. We're going to walk through the temple. We're going to go up the stairs and go through this great gate building. 
We're going to get it into this great, vast pavement area, this outer court. And then I'd ask our little girl, and I'd say, well, who do you want to see? And she'd say, Esther or Ruth. I said, that's okay. So maybe there's benches here, brothers and sisters, too, and we, we can take our children in there. Of course, they'll be 50 years old or better by then, won't they, by the time we walk in there. But they'll be able to sit down and to be able to visualize who we'll see. There'll be wonderful places for people to come and to visit. This isn't some technical, formal, business-like place to meet where you walk in, you sit down, and then you kind of move on and the, the seminar's over, as it were. This is a place, brothers and sisters, of purpose, a place of fellowship, a place of instruction, a place of singing, a place of joy, a place of learning, a place of judgment as well. And in these outer courts, many things will happen. And we might wonder, brothers and sisters, why all these rooms? Why all these places and spaces? And we'll give some suggestions to what some of those are for as we go through uh, the rest of this place. So, the gates. So the suggestion is, brothers and sisters, as, as we look through, that there's about 11 gates on each side. And that's based on some of the math that we can use if we were to dig deeper into, into, into all these measurements and take time, which we can talk about afterwards if you like. But he says he measures that there are 30 chambers as he goes through the three sides that he references. So if we assume that there's 10 on each side, chambers divided by an opening, and if each of those openings is a gateway, we've got either 9 or 11 gates. You've got 10 chambers, you've got to divide them. If you start with chambers in the four corners, then you can have 9 gates. If you start with gates in the corners, you have, you have 11 gates, of course. So many gates, many places of entry. Now one of the things we find uh, about this is with such a vast emphasis on gates, and, and really, as we go through these first 16 verses, once we've kind of got those 16 verses figured out, the rest of the chapter, and you can, if you sort of break it down, verse 17, verse 20, verse 24, verse 28, verse 32, and verse 35, each one of those is going to one of the other gates and basically saying, and I measured that gate, and it was the same as the last. And I measured this gate, and oh, it was the same as the last. He's showing a uniformity as he goes through and takes a sample from each of the four sides as to what these gates are. But you're still impressed when you get to the end of this, brothers and sisters, to say, well, why all this emphasis on gates? Let's have a look. Let's leave that for a moment, brothers and sisters, keep that image in our mind. But go through the scriptures now, and we're going to look at some of the passages which talk about gates and see if we can find some reason why such a focus and an emphasis would be on so many gates. Apart from the, the practical side of many people flowing like a river up to Jerusalem to worship, you're going to need to be able to move people in and move people out. We were talking to someone yesterday and said, well, why do you need such a big gate? Who's ever been to some, whether it's a tourist attraction or even just a checkout line in the store, and you're trying to get through, and you got like a three-hour wait ahead of you to get through. By the time you get in there, you almost don't want to waste time going to see it. That's not how this is going to be. There's not going to be a bottleneck here. God doesn't design a building with a bottleneck. He's designed a building that will flow people who want to ascend up to Jerusalem and they're going to be able to come through. So we're familiar with this passage, Psalm 87 and verse 1 to 3. A psalm or song for the sons of Korah. His foundation is in the holy mountain. Ezekiel has seen a foundation wall. Yahweh loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. Where did Jacob live? Where did Jacob reside? Literally, he traveled, didn't he? He was up in Haran. He was in... Bethel. He was all throughout the land. He ended up in Egypt. Of all those places that Jacob dwelt, the literal Jacob, well, of all of them, there's one place that Yahweh loves. Or whether it was Jacob speaking of, of, of Israel in dispersion. Of all the places where they were, there's only one place that Yahweh loved. He loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. Glorious things are spoken of thee, O city of God. These gates are taking us in to this temple city. Well, let's have a look at these references, brothers and sisters, and we'll just go through them and try and pick out a theme or themes as we go through of what the scripture talks about gates. So if we go to Proverbs chapter 1, and we have a few places here. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 1, and at verse 21. Verse 20, Wisdom cries without. She utters her voice in the streets. She cries in the chief place of concourse. In the openings of the gates, in the city she utters her words, saying, and so on. We know how that goes. But wisdom is portrayed as sourcing from the gates. It cries from the gates. It's the place of instruction. 
a place of wisdom, a place where the word of God is going to go forth. If you turn to Proverbs chapter 8, similarly, we have a picture portrayed. Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 3. She cries at the gates, does wisdom, at the entry of the city, at the coming in at the doors. And so on, the message is given. And then there's an emphasis on right things in verse 6. In righteousness in verse 8. 9 talks about understanding. Verse 10 about instruction, knowledge, and wisdom is better than rubies and so on. So we have this, this image that this entrance of the gate, the coming in, the entering in at a gate should be for the purpose of wisdom and understanding and learning of the righteousness of God. That's where wisdom cries from. And we hear that the word of God is going to go forth from Jerusalem. In Genesis chapter 19 and verse 1, well, we can remember that. That's the story of Lot, isn't it? And we read in James that it was righteous Lot who vexed his soul because of the wickedness of Sodom and cried out against it for God's judgment. And where was he sitting? Well, Lot was sitting in the gate. And why was he sitting there? Well, he was sitting there, brothers and sisters, to judge. Because when we go through, and Lot has this scenario where he says to these wicked men coming to the gate, who say, give us these men. And he basically ridicules their immorality and says, you want men? Why don't you take my daughters? And they know that he is not literally offering his daughters to them, but that Lot is ridiculing their wickedness and their immorality. And what's their response? Lot, you came in here and you didn't cease to judge us from the day you got here. You're always judging us, they say. Where was he? He was in the gate of the city. And so that's the idea of, of judgment in the gate of a city. And we can think of other similar situations where that happens. Zechariah chapter 8 and verse 16. Zechariah chapter 8 and verse 16. And we'll see what even within the prophets. And remember, <coughs> Zechariah is writing during the time when the temple is being built, that temple of the, of, of the um, uh, after the exile that was built in the, in the hands of Ezra and Haggai and Zechariah and so on. This is when Zechariah, so they're building a temple, not the one that their fathers had learned about from Ezekiel, but, but a temporary temple. Zechariah chapter 8 and at verse 16. And he says, These are the things that ye shall do. Speak ye every man the truth to the na his neighbor and execute judgment of truth and peace in your gates. These are the things that we're supposed to be associated with the gates. Truth and justice and righteousness and peace which would follow if the righteousness of God was exercised. In chapter 14 and verse 10, we won't look at it, but the gates are used as boundary markers in that in that uh, description. Genesis chapter 22 and verse 17. We can't escape this. The gate is the place of power. And it's the place of absolute authority. Who is the victor? But the one who possesses the gates. And so the promise that was given of Christ. And to Christ was that. Thy seed Abraham. Shall possess the gate of his enemies. The gate of his enemies of course. Is that victory over sin and death. But it speaks, brothers and sisters, of this ability to control everything. And we think of Samson, who took the gates of Gaza and took them up to a hill overlooking Hebron, the place of the promise. And what was he saying? Samson in type has possessed the gate of his enemies. So if you possess the gate, if you own the gate, you own the city. And in this case, you own the world. Ezekiel chapter 8 and verse 3, 5, and 14, we won't look at, but that gives a contrast. This is what Ezekiel's other message had been about the gate. God's already introduced him to gates, but he says, you know, Ezekiel, come and see what's happening. And he brings him through the gates of the city, and he breaks down a wall, and he says, now look, to have a look at what's happening in here. A place that should be holy. In the chambers of their imagery, what are they doing? They've written on the walls all their idols and all their wickedness. And so Ezekiel has been introduced to gates before. But they represented the wickedness of the people who had, who had defiled everything that God had prepared. And that temple had been raised to the ground because of that. And now he's introduced to gates again in this prophecy. And how will he rejoice now? Because these gates are the gates of righteousness. The gates of wisdom. What about the New Testament? Have a look in the New Testament. Because gates figure very predominantly in the New Testament. But here we're looking at it more from the perspective of what happens at gates. In Luke chapter 7 and verse 12. <clears throat> Luke chapter 7 and at verse 12. 
It came to pass, as he's come to Nain, remember the widow who, who has only one son and he's just died? And in verse 12, And now when he came near to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and much people of the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her, and he said, Weep not, and he touched the bier, and they that bare him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. And the child is raised and restored to the mother. So there we have Jesus is approaching this gate, and death is coming out of the gate. There's no place for it in that gate. It's taken out. And yet Jesus will reverse that. And at this gate, life is given. Brothers and sisters, that fits with what Proverbs was telling us. That wisdom cries out of the gates. Wisdom gives life. That godly wisdom. In Luke 16 and verse 20, again. Luke 16 and verse 20. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores. And ultimately, this Lazarus, yes, it's a parable, but he is going to go from that gate full of sores, and he is going to enter in, in type, in, in, into the kingdom. And again, we know it's a parable with, with, its, with its other uh, inferences and so on. But there is someone in need of healing at a gate. He's not given it by man, but ultimately he is going to receive a blessing. Acts chapter 3 and verse 2, we remember the lame man at the gate. Silver and gold have I none, say the apostles, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, arise and walk. Well, brothers and sisters, in Isaiah chapter 35, what is going to happen in the kingdom? Yes, it's, it's a spiritual lesson that the lame shall leap like the heart. Well, this man had a taste of that at the gate, didn't he? At this gate of the temple. And he is caused to walk. He is able to enter in now. He is no more an outcast that is not allowed. Nothing that is profane can enter in. He is now made whole, as it were. And he enters in rejoicing into the temple. In Acts chapter 12 and at verse 10, we've got the apostle Peter. He is in prison and he gets to a gate and the gate opens. And when that gate is opened, he is given life. The gates of hell, as it were, had been opened. He was no longer typically in the grave. He was let out into this new life. So the gates bring life because they are the wisdom of God. Throughout the Gospels, we read about enter in at the gate that is straight, that narrow gate. Revelation chapter 21, verse 35, uh, sorry, 13 to 25, we won't go there. This is speaking, of course, of this spiritual picture, not the literal temple, but that spiritual temple, which all of this is preparing us all for. And he emphasizes gates. There's gates on the northeast and the south and the west. And there's nine, at least nine times, where gates are mentioned. So significant are they that even in a spiritual picture, which is teaching us other lessons, they are, of course, presented to us. It's incorporated in that. Well, let's look at Revelation 22 and verse 13. One of the last words of our Lord Jesus Christ to us in the context of gates. Verse 13. I am the Alpha and Omega the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to eat, of, uh, sorry, right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates of the city. So this is a call to us, brethren and sisters. To him that overcometh, I will make a pillar in the house of my God. I'll give him to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the garden, and I will allow him to enter into the gates of this city, brothers and sisters. When we enter into those gates, brothers and sisters, we will be among those immortal priests who will be officiating there and ministering to our God for a thousand years. And so just to conclude, in the next few minutes, brothers and sisters, we're just going to read through six or so verses. But let's think of them differently. Now maybe with a bit of a pen picture, and I appreciate that it's just been extremely brief, and just a glimpse of what this might be like with the measurements and so on. But let's read these verses now with a little bit of a different perspective. Picturing ourselves there, as this man of brass is walked through with the line of flax in his hand representing the saints, or whether it be us as represented in Ezekiel, literally walking through and seeing and marveling at the bulwarks and the towers and the pavements and the courts. Let's read these verses a bit differently. His foundation is in the holy mountain. Yahweh loveth the gates of Zion. Glorious things are spoken of thee, O city of God. Of Zion it shall be said that this and that man was born in her. Yahweh shall count when he writes up the people that this man was born there. 
the true children of Zion, the true daughters of Sarah, as it were, who are born there, of whom Sarah is their mother, Jerusalem being the mother of us all. Psalm 100 and verse 4. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. And enter into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him. In verse 18, we could, I see we're running out of time, but just to, to note these verses. Psalm 118, verse 19. Our feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem. Our feet, brothers and sisters. A righteous nation entering in within these gates. And then some more verses that speak about standing in the courts of God. And so, brothers and sisters, we need to be able to look at this and rejoice with this prospect of indeed believing that our feet shall stand in the, the house of God.